Welcome to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan, and we are broadcasting live on August 27th from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. Later on in the show, we're going to talk with two of the defendants in an upcoming trial who've been charged by the government of spreading Russian propaganda to influence American elections. But the Uhuru Three say they were exercising their First Amendment rights to political expression. So that's coming up in a bit. But first, we're going to speak with Kathy, Kathy Celestri, the owner of the Gabber newspaper in Pinellas County and the author of a new book called Florida Spectacular, which comes out next Tuesday. Welcome to Tuesday Cafe, Kathy. Hey, thanks for having me, Sean. It's great to be here. I'm really glad you could come on the, the show. Thanks thanks for coming on. So let's talk about your book first. Why the title Florida Spectacular? Uh, Florida Spectacular because I am tired of people trashing the state that I love. And I had this, this watershed moment 20 some odd years ago, 9-11, I ended up uh, at a business conference in San Diego on 9-11 and ended up taking a Greyhound bus cross country to get back home. And I remember it was it was a days long endeavor. The whole world was in tumult. And when we crossed the Florida state line, the people on the bus cheered. And I remember thinking, man, people are just happy to be home, happy to be back in Florida. And that moment stuck with me as it became increasingly popular to talk about Florida man or how stupid Florida is. And I think, you know, if we're so stupid, why is everybody moving here? Why does everybody want to come here? Why are we the, the fourth largest state? Why are we so fast growing? There must be something right with us. And so if you pull at that thread, there's actually a lot about Florida that is, well, I mean, it's spectacular in a word. It's a pretty great place. What you're doing right now is you're you what you describe as Florida splaining, kind of yes. uh, telling the good news about Florida. I was so happy when that word made it to the index of the book, Florida splaining. Uh, you know, the idea is that you read this book and each chapter is self-contained. And the next time you're at, I don't know, some event or you're visiting, you have relatives from out of town who hate us, but they come here because they want to see Florida. And they say, well, Florida is so stupid. Florida, man, you can go, well, actually, did you know? And then launch into one of the many uh, fun things that we talk about in the book. That's Florida explaining. And that's what we'll be talking about for part of this interview, at least, because the chapters of your book are some of the things that make Florida special. Uh, for example, what can you tell us about Florida history? For example, there were there were all, all sorts of battles and and uh, tug of wars between French settlers and Spanish settlers and the English. Uh, so tell tell us some uh, something that we should know about Florida history. Everything, uh, everything you've been taught is wrong. So we'll start with the thirteen. I'm making air quotes. Original colonies, complete and utter falsehood. I, I know that is going to upset a lot of people in Boston, but um, it was not the 13 original colonies. Those are the 13 of the 22 colonies that chose to have, well, at the time, Floridians would have called it an insurrection against the king. Because when the 13 colonies revolted against the crown, there were two Floridas. There was East Florida and West Florida. And West Florida went from basically the Mississippi River to Apalachicola and East Florida was Apalachicola to the Atlantic. And they were so incensed that there would be a declaration of independence or the Articles of Confederation that they they burned, I believe, John Hancock and Thomas Jefferson in effigies in St. Augustine Square. I, they were absolutely outraged. And so what happened is anybody who was a Tory, who was a loyalist to the crown, fled to the Florida colonies and they supported the crown during, again, they called it an insurrection. Now, we also had some some colonies that became Canadian, but um, you know that, that was the first time Florida was on the losing end of a war. And uh, you know, as a result, Florida has been written out of history so many times. There's so many times in Florida history where we, pay, we played a pivotal role, um, you know, the revolution, Obviously, it didn't go the way those Floridians want it to go. The War of 1812 was another time when, uh, at that point, England had lost what we call the Revolutionary War, and those two Floridas were now Spanish-held. But in the War of 1812, the rest of the world was so worried about this growing United States that it was just going to take over everything, that essentially everybody banded against um 
Spanish Florida, the Brits, the American Indians all banded together to try and stop the expansion of the United States. Again, didn't work out well. We have very rarely been on the right side of a war or the winning side of a war. And there's that great African proverb that until lions have their own historians, tales of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. So um, I want to note that I have a master's degree in Florida studies from USF St. Pete. I didn't learn about that in grad school. I, did, I learned about that through some other research I was doing uh, with the Seminole Tribe of Florida. In 1763, Spain gave up Florida for Havana. Um, and the war between England and Spain, that's called the War of Jenkins' Ear. What's that all about? So <laughs> Florida... Um, I think I say this in the book for a couple of centuries, Florida was like the most popular girl in high school. Everybody wanted to hang out with her. And it wasn't so much our sandy beaches uh, definitely didn't have a theme park here yet, but it was um, the waters around us. They wanted to control the waters and whoever controlled Florida could control the Caribbean, at least this part of it. And as you may imagine, getting over to Mexico, getting to South America, all these things were becoming important on a global scale. So um, the War of Jenkins Ear, uh, I say, if this had gone differently, um, we would be having a lot more uh, chicken cordon bleu and French dishes instead of black beans and rice in Florida. It actually took place um, Georgia, Florida. And the, the whole, the reason we call it the War of Jenkins Ear is there was a man named Jenkins and supposedly soldiers cut off his ear and um, the, the British were so incensed by this, they sent Jenkins Ear back to the king and that was what launched the war. Now, that does not hold up as much as that's a fun story and a great name for a war uh, because there's really no way in in any century maybe now that an ear could survive a transatlantic passage and make it back but i love that that was one where the national institute of health actually studied that account of the war of jenkins ear and where the ear would have been cut off and um it's just fun to say the war of jenkins ear uh -huh. Our guest is Kathy Salustri, the owner of the Gabber newspaper in Pinellas County and the author of a new book, Florida Spectacular. This is Tuesday Cafe. We're broadcasting from the studios of WMNF in Tampa, and I'm Sean Canan. So far, we've talked a lot about history, but much of your book is really about appreciating the, the environment of Florida right now. Uh, for example, uh, you and your family really appreciate Florida Springs. What can you tell our audience that they might not know about Florida water and Florida Springs? Oh, well, the first thing is that there is nowhere else on the planet that has a higher concentration of springs in Florida. We have almost a thousand freshwater springs. They are all connected by a common source, which is the Florida aquifer, which is just this beautiful pressurized limestone underground tunnel of water that starts in South Carolina and it feeds all these springs and it gives us some of the purest water on the planet. And, and we're very fortunate for that. Um, that is of course, till it, it gets to the surface and then it has to contend with uh, nutrients, which is a healthy sounding word for some bad sounding things like fertilizer, pesticides, herbicides, that can change the water quality. But coming from the aquifer, these springs are issuing for some of the cleanest purest water on the planet they're magic what's your favorite spring oh don't ask me that that's like asking me to pick a favorite cheese um i really you know they're all different i know people say oh they're a spring but um i can't tell you a favorite i can tell you one of my favorite moments at a spring was years ago before it was quite as crowded as it is now I took my husband, uh, we were camping, we were working on my first book, and we were at Wakiva Springs State Park. And before we got to our campsite, there was a storm coming. And I said, let's go down to the spring. Uh, you know, the spring head is there. And <clears throat> he had heard me talk about springs. He um, had been to some smaller ones that really weren't as significant. But the look on his face when he saw Wakiva Springs, it was like, he's like, I had no idea. And it made me realize that as environmentalists, we do a really good job about talking about, we have to protect this, we have to save this. But I don't think sometimes we do as good of a job as we can of talking about 
the sheer beauty and wonder. Like not so much we have to save it, but why we have to protect it. What's what is so amazing and allowing people to experience it. I'm going to talk about the Florida Panthers now for a second right uh, just now. What's the, um, you know, we we know that the Florida Panther population is very low compared to how it was before humans arrived in Florida. But what's the, the significance of having female panthers north of the Caloosahatchee River? Why is that important and how recent of a development is that? Okay, so first of all, it is lowest. I just want to go back and just tweak something you said. The population is not low because of humans. It is low because of European Americans. The ancestors of the Seminole and the Miccosukee did a far better job with sustainability. It was when we came here and decided to alter the landscape that really imperiled the panther. And um, that relates exactly to the panthers not one, the female panthers not wanting to go north of the Caloosahatchee. We know that male panthers need roughly 200 square miles to do all the panther things they want to do. Um, and the male panthers have been pretty good about crossing the river. Uh, once upon a time, by the way, the Caloosahatchee did not connect all the way to Lake Okeechobee. So it was much easier for cats to get farther north in Florida. Um, that is one of the things that we did as European Americans when we came here is we decided the river needed to connect, made it harder. Cats, by the way, are excellent swimmers. If you don't believe me, take your house cat, throw it in your swimming pool. Cat will hate you forever, but it's going to swim great. Uh, the females, though, were reticent to cross this river. So we had this wonderful program that is really a testament to what you can do if you decide you want to stop a species um, from going extinct. And we had reintroduced uh, some cats to South Florida. They bred. We started to see more panther kits. We started to see more male panthers crossing, but the female panthers wouldn't cross the Caloosahatchee River. So the male panthers could only go so far because they could they could go wander up uh up the Kissimmee River Valley they could follow you know some some cattle ranches they there's a lot of green space they could still go to but if they wanted to make more kittens or more panthers they had to go back south to find the females and um it was a huge huge triumph a few years ago when a contractor Jennifer Korn she was a contractor working for the FWC and she was monitoring the camera feed. And I, I saw her speak right after it happened. It was a very informal gathering. And she talked about checking the camera and having to check the location a couple of times because it was uh, a female panther with, I believe, two kittens. And the camera was very clearly north of the Caloosahatchee. And um, it, it was this great moment because we had reintroduced yeah, we had gotten the species to start breeding again, but we knew that until we could get those females north of the Caloosahatchee, it was going to be an issue. Like there were going to be too many panthers for the species to thrive south of the Caloosahatchee. So this was the first sign that we saw that we were doing something else right, that Florida had done something worthwhile, something markedly different, that we were going to be able to see hope for this this big cat species. Our guest is Kathy Silustri, the owner of the Gabber newspaper in Pinellas County, and she's author of the new book, Florida Spectacular. This is Tuesday Cafe. We're broadcasting from the studios of WMNF Tampa. I'm Sean Canan, and we're live on the 27th of August. And the reason I say that is because I'm going to read a few emails that have come in. Some people are responding to the interview. So I want to just to read through a couple of these, and maybe you can respond if you feel uh, that it's appropriate. Uh, someone from the 239 area code says, it's my job, in my job, I deal with new homeowners, usually from up north, and they're almost all brainwashed Trump cult members moving here because of the lack of income tax and an unjustified reverence for our fascist governor. That's part of what 239 is writing. Also, Jessica writes, I can't wait to read your book. Thank you for putting this together. So thanks for that comment, Jessica. And Greg asks a question that maybe, Kathy, you know the answer to. Has your guest heard the Native American legend that North America is a deer on which Florida is the nose that will one day fall off? Well, those are some of the comments that have come in during the interview. If you want to respond to any of those, or I can or I can ask you about the Florida Wildlife Corridor. Uh, well, I would love to first thank Jessica. Um, I don't know where you are, Jessica. I hope you can come out. I have signings and book talks all over the state. And um, 
would love to see you at one. Um, not going to touch much about the Trump governor comment, except to say, I wish that we could uh, find ways to recoup that income tax, because I think our wildlife would benefit from it and our natural environment would benefit from it. And then as for the, the legend about the deer on the nose, uh, one of the chapters in the book, I worked very closely with the Seminole tribe of Florida, and I was very fortunate that after a couple of years of working on this chapter, I did get the tribe to sign off on it because I was adamant that I was not going to write something about a group of people without the group of people saying that I had gotten it right because there are a lot of books out there about different tribes that um, haven't really talked to the tribes. We call it the white man's version of history or colonialism. Uh, so in writing this chapter, I spent some time down at Atatiki at the Tribal Historic Preservation Office, uh, talking to people, talking to uh, staff there, talking uh, to, um, or going through their archive room, which is incredible. Uh, it's just a beautiful, beautiful archive room. And the one thing that I came to understand and that we could do a better job teaching kids in, in elementary school and middle grades, high school, is that just as you can't look at a group of white people and say, oh, they all think this, or a group of gay people and say, oh, well, they all believe this, or a group of black people and say, oh, well, they all think this. You can't say all American Indians believe this. Uh, for example, I use the term American Indian when I am referring to the Seminole tribe of Florida, because when I asked them what they preferred, indigenous, native, they said American Indian. So that's what I use. Other tribes feel different. So the long, the short answer after my long explanation of that is no, I have not heard that. I, I have read a bit from the tribe about different clans that they had, had not heard that legend, but just because that is not something I know that the Seminole tribe of Florida doesn't have in a lot of its records doesn't mean that it doesn't belong to another tribe of, of American Indians or indigenous people. So, and I'd love to talk about the corridor or our parks, whatever you want, any of our natural areas. Yeah. So in, in 2021, the legislator created a $400 million fund for the Florida wildlife corridor. Maybe you can tie that into how important that is to the Panthers or just talk about the wildlife corridor in general about uh, why it's important to the state and to wildlife. Well, I'm sure um, Mallory likes Dimmitt or Carlton Ward or somebody could speak more eloquently on this, but I have, um, I have a lot of strong feelings about why the corridor works. And, and part of it, yes, is the Panther. Part of it is, uh, honestly, global warming. Part of it is that I am always impressed by what we can do when we get a little pragmatic about things, right? So the corridor starts in Big Cypress, which is in South Florida, Big Cypress National Preserve, moves up across the state, and there are uh, a lot of different types of land in the corridor. There's private land, there's public land. Um, Disney Wilderness Preserve, which I also write about in the book, is part of the corridor. So we have national parks. Uh, privately held reserves, we have private land. And yes, it's been incredibly important for not only the panther, but other animals in Florida to be able to migrate, to follow some semblance of what would have been their historic migratory patterns. So it's a beautiful way to engage different stakeholders in, in Florida. And another thing that I find so significant about the, the corridor is that it helps um, it helps show people that you can don't have to be extreme. Like I am probably one of the most extreme liberal people you will meet. And that's okay. I, I know where to use it and where not to. But when it comes to things like the environment, I believe we have to be more pragmatic than I would want to be in my own personal life. We can't say, we need to get rid of all the farms and have parks, or we can't say we need to get rid of all the cattle ranches and have parks. So what we do, and what I think the beauty of the Florida Wildlife Corridor does, is they meet people where they are. They go to the ranchers and they say, look, if we can get a conservation easement, if you give, if you sell us your development rights, we're going to pay you for it, and we're going to let you stay here, and you can ranch cattle forever. But what you can't do 
is sell your land to a developer who's going to put a suburb there. And in doing that, they're preserving a lot of different parts of Florida. Yes, it's super important to have the green space and carbon sequestration so that we can mitigate some of what we're seeing with climate change. Yes, it's super important to be able to have those migratory pathways and the green space for wildlife. But on a cultural level, it's also super important that we preserve these folkways in Florida, that we preserve cattle ranching in Florida. I mean, I don't think we're ever going to get to a point where people don't eat meat or drink milk. I don't eat it that much. I, I don't really drink milk, but I understand a lot of people do. And you can't just simply say, rip it all down. And cattle ranching goes back hundreds of years, 500 years. Ponce de Leon, uh, the Spanish conquistadors, brought the first herd of cattle to the United States through Florida, the Andalusian cattle. And that's always there. And if we let that get sold, you know, I say if we if we let it become a Michaels and a Dick's Sporting Goods and a Coles, we're losing a part of our culture. And I, I don't think that's acceptable. I think that that's part of what makes Florida, Florida, just as much as the trees and the springs and the panther. Let's talk. Uh, we can come back to the book in just a moment if we need to, but um, let's talk about what's going on right now in when it comes to Florida and nature. The big news story of the last seven or eight days has been a proposal to add things like hotels, golf courses, and pickleball courts to Florida state parks. Now, it, there's been a lot of pushback, a ton. There's been huge demonstrations, and uh, there's uh, there's going to be one that we're reporting on this afternoon at Honeymoon Moon Island. So, Kathy, what can you, uh, what kind of insight can you give us about this proposal to kind of make private development happening at the Florida state parks? So, first of all, it should not happen. It's awful. Um, there is a form that the DEP has for people to fill out and give feedback. And I went through and I gave feedback on every single one of the proposals. And the only one that I 100% favored was adding some more uh, camping facilities. Um, my first book, Back Roads of Paradise, which was published in 2016, when I was working on that, we spent a month traveling what are now the back roads of Florida. We were in a camper van and for all but two nights of that month, we spent the night in Florida State Parks. Um, one of those nights, we had to stay at a private campground, and it was anathema to everything I love about Florida. And if you love going to a private campground and having a swimming pool and racquetball and a game room, go to a private campground. But our state parks are not part of a separate parks department. They're part of the Department of Environmental Protection. And the DEP's mission is pretty clear. It's to protect the environment. And when we talk about removing part of the natural environment to put in a golf course, that is not with the DEP's mission. In addition, uh, it competes with private industry. I do not believe the government should compete with private businesses. I think private businesses should be able to su succeed on their own without having to fight a government that can do it for a lot cheaper. Um, when we talk about those lodges they call them lodges and i find that just adorably this an adorable bit of spin um because they compare it to the wakulla springs lodge up in the panhandle what they aren't saying is that first of all that lodge is a historic lodge it was there before it was a park it was not built by the dep it was part of an area that the dep deemed important to protect and it already had the lodge there and it's 27 rooms what the dep is proposing is a three or several 350 room uh hotels they're hotels and again one of them's going at Anas. they want to put it in at anastasia state park which was right by saint augustine well if you've driven us1 or a1a there is no shortage of lodging there um there's absolutely there's no dearth of of quality inns anastasia has camping it has rv camping it has tent camping i don't think that there's a reason to go there to stay in a hotel when you can go to any hotel on the beach. And it's a small park. Um, now, pickleball, I, I get it. People love pickleball. I have a pickleball racket. I get it. The state parks are not the place for that. If the state feels so very strongly that we are suffering from a lack of pickleball courts, you know what? Give the counties and cities money to buy some of these properties. Every county in in the state has properties in their county or city limits that are probably um, 
either in foreclosure, neglected, abandoned, have code liens, give the money to the cities and counties and let them do that and create a pickleball court. Because when you do it in a state park, you're paving for the court, you're paving for parking. Finally, I mean, there's more. I could do this for two hours. The biggest thing to me is that the state's making it sound like these parks are suffering for attendance, and that's patently not true. Um, I go to these parks. I, I spend time in these parks. There are lines to get in these parks. Some of these parks close for capacity on the weekends. We don't need to do anything else to drive people to the parks. What we need to be doing is creating more state parks. And, and that's where I would like to see our priorities shift instead of trying to decide where to put a mega hotel. Our guest is Kathy Salustri, the owner of the Gabber newspaper in Pinellas County and the author of a new book, Florida Spectacular. This is Tuesday Cafe, and we're broadcasting from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. I'm Sean Canan. So let's talk about the Gabber. Um, what is the Gabber? How long have you owned it? What, what brought you to own the Gabber, and what do you hope to do with it? Uh, <clears throat> thanks for asking. The Gabber newspaper is the oldest independent weekly newspaper, not an alt weekly, not a niche paper. We are the oldest one in Florida, which isn't even that old. It was started in 1968. I am, uh, we are the fourth owners. We bought it during the pandemic. I freelanced for the paper for, I don't know, 13 years, left, uh, worked for another publication, freelanced again, wrote a book, all that stuff. And one of my one of my close friends was the editor. And during the early stages of the pandemic, she called me and said, um, hey, just so you know, they're going to close the paper this week. And it bothered me. So I wrote a piece for the Tampa Bay Times about what it meant to South Pinellas or essentially Gulfport and the Beaches to lose its newspaper. And the Times at the end of the piece put my email address and I started getting emails from people going, oh, I remember so-and-so or this and that. And I would pass some on to the people who still owned it. And one of them, one of the two owners responded and said, I don't know what we're going to do with this. So-and-so wants to sell. I'm not sure I do. And I said, well, if you decide you want to sell, let me know. And um, by the end of the week, long story short, we had a, a deal to buy the paper and uh, did, brought it back to print uh, the second week of July 2020. And it's really been interesting because the paper was started in 1968 by a gentleman and his wife, George Braun, and he didn't like what was happening at Gulfport City Hall. And he wanted to essentially, I want to just make people know what's going on. And that's kind of continued. But what's really interesting is that the paper started covering other cities in the early 90s. And now with the lack of consistent coverage of any of the smaller smaller cities in Pinellas County. We have 24 cities here. We get emails and phone calls from people saying, can you please cover our city hall? Something's happening. Can you, can you look into this? And we have now expanded. We're covering um, four cities on the beach. We're looking for reporters and revenue to cover more. We've seen a news desert created by the daily paper of record. Um, that only covers the larger cities. And so we're finding a lot of opportunity to go in there. And, you know, we had a case where the Madeira Beach mayor resigned claiming corruption. And that was a really interesting story. And people are hungry for this news. People want to know what's happening in their backyard. It's something they have control over. Like you might not have a lot of control over what happens in DC. You might not have as much control as you'd like over what happens in Tallahassee. But you can, if you know what's going on, you have the power to change what's happening on your block and in your city. And during Tropical Storm Debbie a few weeks ago, uh, the Gabber was right there for the, the coverage of a, a really sad story that happened. Uh, there was a death locally in Gulfport. What can you tell our audience about Brian J. Clough, the and about the boating community and their response before and the, after the storm? So... <clears throat> We have uh, Gulfport, our offices are in downtown Gulfport. Gulfport is on Boca Ciega Bay. Um, there is a barrier island between Boca Ciega Bay and the Gulf of Mexico. So it's this place where boaters, boaters like to come and some boaters anchor. The city of Gulfport also has a mooring field. Some boaters pay to be on the mooring field. And um, you know, ever all bets are kind of off when a storm is coming. The, the, 
public safety officials try and convince boaters who are anchored to move their boats. They're not always successful. Um, Brian, uh, I did not know Brian. And uh, I guess his solution, I believe, as I understand it from his, his fellow boaters, he was trying to set more anchors, set out more anchors. He was anchored. He was not on a mooring ball. He was, uh, you know, his boat didn't quite stay in place. And um, you know, the boating community, there's been a lot of uh, people who, some people are very supportive. Some people, this is a little bit of a hot button issue because some people don't feel like boaters are responsible. And that that's not true. Um, some boaters, yes. Some people buy a boat they can't afford and it ends up turning to junk. But the majority of boaters I know are responsible who, you know, they they are taking care of their craft um, and bad things happen sometimes. And, and I want to interject here for a yes. second. Right now, when we say the word boaters, we're not talking about recreational boaters who take their no. boats out on Sunday. We're talking about people who live aboard their vessels out in Boca Ciega Bay. Right. We also have cruisers who uh, maybe don't live aboard their vessels, maybe have a home somewhere, but they're on a on a quest, on a journey. So uh, this is where it gets a little murky. We're talking about these liveaboards. I believe Brian was a liveaboard. I don't think he was cruising. Um, it was incredibly tragic. And it was also upsetting to watch how the story unfolded because um, there's a difference between how um, a local newspaper covers something and perhaps a TV affiliate because people love the news stations love to come to Gulfport and they film themselves with the background with the waves and I saw a lot of that and my editorial staff and I you know we have the high water boots we walked down to see what was going on and in talking to people we found out about Brian and it kind of upset me that these other people were there just getting these beautiful keep people watching for ratings, backdrops, but they weren't talking to any of these people. And there was this whole community right there that was furiously trying to find out what had happened to a few boaters. I mean, it was a, it was a we talked a lot in Louisiana uh, about the Cajun Navy. It was something very similar to that where the local boaters, whether they lived on a boat or whether they had a boat and lived on land, were really mounting this grassroots effort to find these people and they did find some people there were there were more people missing at the start of the day than there were at the end most of them were found alive um the the these wonderful men and women they didn't get to brian in time i still don't know exactly what his time of death was and honestly i just wish he, his family the best they're going through a horrible time but they did find his dog they saved his little dog and you know it it's these are the stories I think that we need to amplify is that in these horrible times, there are still really good people and they were doing everything they could to help each other. And I wish that everybody wanted to tell those stories instead of going for some more sensational things, but that's my own rant. I apologize. Well, no, thank you for, for that because I, I think it was a really important story that happened during the hurricane and um, the Gabber told it very well in my opinion and um, I, it's something that now we're going to be watching out for the next time a storm comes is is how, how the uh, community responds to the boating community bef before the storm and during the storm. And I want to thank you very much for joining us today, Kathy. Thanks for coming on Tuesday Cafe. Oh, thank you, Sean. This has been great. And I hope to see you again soon. Have a great day. All right. Thank you, too. Kathy Celestri's new book is called Florida Spectacular. And if you missed any of this interview, you can watch it later today on WMNF.org. This is Tuesday Cafe. We're broadcasting from the studios of WMNF in Tampa.